Air. <laughs> Recordings in progress. Okay, so, so as you can see, a, 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 um, a project where people are documenting their own lives, um, people who are refugees. I was very interested in this um, because a lot of it had taken place um, in Greece. Um, and what you will also find as part of this, this what I would call a resource for us, is um, image, the images that were created with a story written by the people. Um, so there's this a huge resource, an amazing resource of storytelling, narrative telling and, and authentic narrative that exists. And this is one of the things about the, the joys we have in living in the digital age, that there's so much out there that we can use and, and adapt for our own teaching situations. So let me take you back though, to when I started teaching in 1992, I went to Athens to do a C-Tefla, it was before CELTA existed. It was like a CELTA, I think. And there were no, there was no computers. There was no, um, there was certainly no internet. Um, I think we had those, uh, what was it? We loved those, those, uh, the plastic sheets that you put onto the, <laughs> I can't even remember what we call them now, but you remember them. Um, and we used to draw our own pictures. And this book here, um, for any of you of a certain age and who has worked in EFL or in English language teaching, I'm sure you've all used this book at some point to teach you how to draw something. And I suppose it's at this point that I started to think about um, being a bit creative with my teaching. I had some lesson that I had to plan for the C-Tefla and I, I, I had no idea how to lift it off the page of the course book. And, you know, I went to my trainer and I said, oh, I have to do this thing. I think it was about, um, maybe it was, um, anyway, I had some language point that was a bit dry. And I said, what do I do with this? And he said, here I am waiting for some help. And he said, that's easy and he closed the door on me. So, <laughs> so I created this, this lesson where I, I drew pictures um, using this book. And I told a story about a man who had stolen a tin of tuna. And the last image in my pictures was that the tin of tuna was under his hat. So I had a man with a hat. And I, I haven't got that picture anymore, as you can imagine, it's a long time ago. But so storytelling, I think, has been part of my, um, my DNA for, for um, in teaching. And after a couple of years, I left, I left uh, Greece and I came back to Glasgow with the full intention that I would not teach English anymore. I was completely bored by it. And I hoped to become some kind of famous businesswoman and make lots of money. Um, but I ended up, of course, couldn't get a job and so did lots of community ed work and then ended up at Langside College. And when I started there, we were working mainly with um, students who were based in Glasgow um, or who had lived in Glasgow for a long time. So settled ethnic minority students and um, lots of European students, mostly who were au pairs. Um, and then we became a dispersal city for asylum and everything changed. And this was when it got really interesting, actually. Um, so we were using very, the usual EFL materials. I think we were using Headway at the time, would have been one of the classics. Um, but then we started realizing we couldn't actually teach the students that we had in front of us um, I did an ESOL literacies course with the London Language and Literacy Unit um, and learned a lot about teaching students who had no literacy in their first language. So that was important for me. And from that, I actually developed my first pack of materials with somebody called Susan eh, Sarah Dono. And we wrote these materials, which were basically just um, scripts, short scripts of stories for students, very, very simple stories. And they were laminated, I remember. And we went to our boss and asked for money for them, which was great. <laughs> he paid us for them. 
we started using the ESOL Skills for Life materials as well, which, which existed at the time. And then, of course, the citizenship materials were also launched and we, we, we were using these. So we were starting to delve into different types of material. Um, and then at, I was actually part of Natekla Scotland at the time. I was chairing Natekla Scotland at the time. And for some reason, and I don't know how I learned about Melanie Cook, but somehow I learned something about Melanie Cook and I invited her to Glasgow to give us a talk. And she came to Glasgow and she talked about this paper that I've, I've put up here, which was about the stories of adult ESOL learners in England. And it was, I thought, I remember she was reading the scripts, the stories of the students, and I was thinking, oh, you're not supposed to read off of a PowerPoint. But it was wonderful to hear their voices, even through somebody else's voice. And this really inspired me, I think. I think she inspired me, and her colleague at the time was James Simpson. And he also, he was, he's now at Leeds University, very inspirational in the work that they were doing, where they were questioning how people were being taught and whether the types of English that we were teaching was actually appropriate for people's lives and for them to, to meet their full potential, as she said here. So there's a little one story of, of how I became um, involved in thinking about stories and people's stories. And at Langside College, we had a, an amazing bunch of teachers together. So there was a, as some of you will know, a Steve Brown, who does a lot of work on emancipation these days. Um, there was Ken McDougall, who I met there. Um, there was Neil McMillan, who some of you might know, who does a lot of work now. He's now based in Spain, but he does a lot of work on task-based learning. And he runs his own task-based learning course. Um, and again, very inspirational people in terms of their thinking and willing to discuss ideas and come up with ideas about how we could teach. Um, so the, 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 the work that we were doing at, at the college became really quite important to us. And so I decided to actually keep doing the job. <laughs> But I did get a little bit bored with what I was doing and an opportunity came up to work at the Scottish Qualifications Authority to create um, a qualification for community learning. Um, um, mostly for, the idea was for volunteers. Um, and we, we developed a qualification called the PDA ITSOL, um, which was nothing to do with IT. It was an introduction to TESOL. And, um, Luckily, because the Scottish government was given us lots of money, we had all this time to create materials. I'd, I just show you this picture just again about eclecticism because this picture was a, a picture that my daughter, a photograph my daughter took um, when she was a, she was doing her Duke of Edinburgh award, I think, and she was in a canoe or something, and she took the picture of the the cow, and I used this image. Um, for some language work that the trainee teachers were doing. But then we got the chance, because we had money, we got the chance to go and speak to students themselves. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of a taste. Some of you might have seen some of these videos before, but I'm going to give you just a little bit of a taste of what the students said to us. This all took place at Clyde Bank College. So Sheena, you might have been around at the time. <laughs> um, but we're going to hear from four different speakers um, talking about their lives in Scotland and learning ESOL in Scotland. I can't play the whole thing or we'll run out of time. So I'll just play little bits of it to give you an idea. Um, my name is Ante Kadir and I'm from Somalia. And um, I'm 20 years old and I'm, I've been in, in school now for six months now. And I'm enjoying to live in school. Everybody knows what's happening in Somalia. There's few war and there's a lot of horrible things happening there. So that's why I, I came in this country. Let's hear some more of them. 
Thanks. It's cool. In Somalia, I can say we didn't have chance for studying and for going for, uh, for in Somalia and the wounds, the wound gang, I can say that. So we didn't have chance to do anything to study or to work. Yeah, yeah so we, they push us to to corner, I can say. When I come in Scotland, missing for my, for me, if the other people uh, they say something. For me, I'm, I'm saying we're hundred percent perfect. And the only problem I can say is uh, I'm far from the college, so I can say it's it's hard to come. It took me sometimes two hours to get a college. So. Sometimes, yeah, but I'm always on time. So I hope I will do something good for my future and my uh, my country and all my, also my family. And um, but I didn't say it. Yeah, what I'm gonna be in the future. I hope it will be something good for everyone. Well, if my job. I had two jobs and uh, I went to elementary college, so I don't have time for learn English, for homework. Uh, I went to the college, but I don't learn. So I, I leave all, uh, move uh, to Baloch. So for my friends, my idea <laughs> was very, very good. Uh, I'm very happy now, but I still uh, looking job. Here it's uh, difficult than Glasgow. I, I more understand, uh, I feel better, uh, I don't have barrier, I, I can talk. Uh... Okay, and we have one more. I just tried to check the times of it. <laughs> this is a hard job getting the timing right. Very helpful. It's my first time to learn English. I mean, to learn in formal way English. So. I have more positive uh, impression than uh, anything else. We had two uh, good teachers, two uh, ladies, very, very nice. And uh, they were very creative. You don't just study uh, grammar or there, 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 there was always fun and uh, games. English is a bridge, and uh, when you live in the country, you have to, to, to communicate with people. And I want to learn it, maybe not perfectly, but in a high, as, as, as high as I can. In college, I... I registered in 2007 in Amsterdam College, but uh, I haven't choice for baby, not place for her. I waiting two years. Now uh, I say, come, I go to start in August. Hope to work, yes. Okay. What kind of work? Uh, I can work. Just work to help myself. Um, and okay so you met four of the students who who told their stories and these um stories were very poignant i think for many of us who were training uh, teachers and i still knew certain words and phrases that i wanted people to hear today i wanted you to hear english as a bridge i wanted you to hear um uh, Abdi, who I don't think any of us will ever forget, when he said, I'm always on time. It's very, very emotional, actually. So, <laughs> so this was something that was very, very important in terms of bringing authenticity into the into what we were doing in Scotland. And this was through materials. And this is what you can do with materials, actually, when you use real lives and real things happening. Um, so then let me move on a little bit. I went to um, Ayatafel, 
Um, I think it was round about, I don't know, maybe it was 2010 or something like that. <laughs> anyway, it was in Harrogate. And the final, I was presenting about our, our work that we had been doing in Scotland. And the final presentation, um, the final plenary was by a woman called Jan Benjamin. And she is one of the most incredible storytellers. And Jan Benjamin, I mean, I've just got a clip to show you just her, her speaking. You can watch it again on your own. I'll just play maybe half of it. But Jan, 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 Jan Benjamin um, blew everybody away in the audience at Harrogate. We were laughing, we were crying, we were standing up, we were doing actions when she told us to do it. It was incredible. So let's just hear her talking a little bit about storytelling. I think I'm going to put it in about a little bit. Yeah, let's start here. And that's where I was. Uh, then I, I became a storyteller, mainly for financial reasons. I was broke. Someone suggested I could make 20 pounds an hour as a storyteller. I said, that's the job for me. And I pursued a career as a storyteller. And I was encouraged by a woman called Eno Saucy to really embrace storytelling, to embrace my own culture through storytelling. And it was through embracing my own culture through storytelling, through telling stories, singing songs, rhymes and riddles, playground games, things that I hadn't actually had access to in England, but were from my parents' tradition, suddenly something within me opened, something within me softened. I felt more connected with people because I, I felt I had more access to the things that made me, me, even though I didn't quite know who me was before that time. When I started storytelling, I, cho I chose stories that were quite shallow, really. But that's because at the time I was quite young and I didn't really have a grasp on the world or my place in it. As I developed as a human being, as I read more stories, as I heard more stories, as I immersed myself in more stories, as I grew up, as I became a mother, I was able to tell stories with a bit more gravitas. And I was able to come to an understanding of what my role was as a storyteller. Yes, stories are entertaining. I'm an entertaining storyteller. Well, I hope you think that when I finished. But the most important thing that I discovered is that as a storyteller... Oh, <laughs> sorry, I've just... ...of humanity, that what I want to do is embrace everybody, give everybody permission just to be a flawed human being, but with possibilities, with potential and with hope. Does that make sense to you? Yes, you're very quiet for an audience. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, we have to move on from 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 uh, Jan Benjamin. So, so Jan, so so watching Jan Benjamin and and listening to her talking about storytelling started to have quite a big impact on me. I think, and um, this this next thing is is um, I have to I have to mention my husband Ken here because he used to talk about this thing called magic mirror and i had and if i think i i missed the bit on jan benjamin's talk where she said i'll hold up a mirror to you so actually in some materials i've written for the students that i work with in china we actually play that clip to them at the beginning before we do this activity with them but magic mirror um, is is a very very simple activity actually um, where it's really a blank piece of paper, although I've drawn a lovely pretty mirror here. Um, I wrote materials for the ESOL Nexus project and they asked me, could you create some lessons where you can show techniques, things that you, how you can, ways of teaching. And so I had spoken to Ken about this activity many times because he always used it in all his teacher training courses. And then all of us started using it in our teacher training courses and, and also with students for speaking activities. So basically the students, the students 
are you, the teacher tells the students a story about themselves with an image. The students then create their own story using the magic mirror where they're told that they can, they can go into the past, the future, wherever you want them to go. And then they share the stories with each other. And usually some music is played while they're creating. The interesting thing about this, this activity is that no matter how much you think that students will not do it and will feel reticent to draw pictures, in the end, you always have a class full of students with these images ready for them to tell stories. And I've added some things into the materials that I use with Magic Mirror, where I've added some quotations in about um, storytelling, which I use after the students have, have told their stories to each other, where we discuss what kind of stories they've told. And you find that they're very universal, actually, the stories they tell. Um, and then we discuss which, which of these quotes are your favorite. And we, they, they go away with something that maybe there's a, there's a quote that they like to keep for themselves. So these are some of the reasons I would say are the reasons for using, for using stories in the classroom. And if you get the chance no. to try out Magic Mirror, you can find the materials that I created, but actually you don't need materials. You just need a story and tell the students to draw something but you can look at the materials I've written here on the British Council website, if you like. Um, and as I say, there's one task, one thing you can take away with you. It belongs to the students, it's authentic, it's the students' own voices coming out in the, in the material. Actually, it's completely material free, which is fantastic. You don't need any materials for this, this task. And while I was on Twitter again at the weekend, I found this lovely link where somebody was talking about all the different ways on different languages of how you say once upon a time. And this really brings out the universality of, 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 uh, of storytelling. I mean, I think this could be a fantastic activity asking students to, to, to tell us how they say it in their own language. You could also use it for them to choose their favorite way of starting a story from these, etc. So it's another way where you can find things everywhere that could be used in the classroom. Okay, so my next my next venture was to to leave work, woo, and I did a master's at a, in linguistics at Edinburgh University, and for my um, for my master's, I did a talk a paper on beginner ESOL learners. So I interviewed ESOL learners and talked to them about their lives. And I was very, very um, inspired by this first book by a woman called Bonnie Norton um, about identity and language learning. And I've got the book here where she, she basically um, follows the stories of a group of women and their language learning journeys. And it's a fascinating book. Um, and it really inspired me for my dissertation. Um, and there's, it's really beautiful about how it gets us to think about why, as, as the preface says here, it says that often the, the person who's eclipsed or disappeared in all language learning materials is the learner themselves. Well, not in language, this was about research, that the learner isn't the person that's being researched, it's other aspects of language that is researched. And um, it's, it's very, very interesting, the idea that it says, um, and one would have to say the lack in practice of some consistent and ongoing engagement by many researchers with the actualities of language learning in contexts other than their privileged and often fleeting encounters with selected learners in educational institutions. So there's, it's highly recommended this book if anybody wants to read it. In the, I've got the, so this, this again brings in a lot about this idea. I listen to people talking, telling me their stories. I tried to write a dissertation about it. One of my, my, uh, 
<laughs> markers loved it, the other one hated it. So there you go. <laughs> it wasn't the most successful. <laughs> I passed, but... Um... So now let me tell you just something about how I write materials. So, <laughs> um, I guess you might know this person here, Jackson Pollock. I think he's called Action Painting. I kind of think of myself as a bit of a Jackson Pollock when I'm making materials. I don't start off with any linear process. I kind of throw everything together. I come up with lots and lots of ideas and then I start to pull together the narrative. But I certainly don't start with a very linear process. So I kind of see myself a bit Jackson Pollock. And that's where my colleague Susan comes in very handy. She's great at keeping me kind of more processed and uh, with deadlines. And she also is great at creating templates, which you often need if you're going to try and construct materials that other people can use. Okay, so here are some principles that I would say about, about um, language uh, materials development for me. Um, when I say don't focus on specific language items, I just mean that that doesn't have to be the focus. It might be, but it doesn't need to be. You, if you look at the material first, things emerge, as does the language from students. I think we've talked a little bit about discursive uh, spaces and storytelling. I would also say that when you're writing material, you have to create the narrative of the lesson. You have to see how the things link together so that you get this flow in the lesson. And that's a really nice feeling when you create that. And I think as you, as you pull bits together, you say, where am I going from each part? Don't be afraid of using first language or bringing the students' voices into the, the classroom. I don't have time to talk about L1, but I think that's important. Um, something I also think is that getting used to creating your own audios is really, really helpful. It's dead easy. You can create lots of stuff. You can do lots of things with it. You can record other people. Um, you can ask people questions, you can do all sorts of things and you have a wealth of material again. I think it's important that we are multimodal and multi-sensory, although I, I, I don't think that's anything to do with learning styles. I think that's to do with us needing lots of different types of input. And I also think we need to work with others and help. You, and when if you are a materials writer or a creator and you help other people design materials, you often see the flaws in your own materials because you can recognize things that don't work quite so well. And you also need to listen to feedback. So those are some principles to start with. Might be some more later. Um, okay, I spoke to a woman called Catherine Billsborough just the other day, um, who um, is a part of the IATFL uh, materials SIG. Um, and she's written some articles for the modern English teacher. And what she's found out is that most people become materials writers just through trial and error. You're not trained. You don't need to be trained. You just need to try and do stuff. And the reason she says that, that, that it's valuable to write your own materials basically comes down to the fact that you can bring in aspects of, aspects of things which will not be in um, your commercial published materials. You can do things that are more up to date and you can do things that are localized and contextualized. So I promised to talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. I'm getting worried about the time now. <laughs> That's what videos do for you. Okay, so um, I, I would, I would say to you that if you want to read more about um, the whole aspect of LGBT materials um, and, and the fact that they don't exist in any um, published or in very few published materials today, uh, John Gray, I've given you a reference to something that he's written on this and he's done fantastic work on this. Um, why does it matter? Because if we're not saying anything, then we are complicit, I think, is, is the point. And we are not neutral. Um, Bakhtin, 
um, who I haven't given you a reference to, but you can look him up. He talks about how um, we construct things through our dialogue and that's how we create meaning. So for me, everything you put on a page is adding to what's the, na the narrative that's going on. Um, and Frere also mentions this idea of us never being neutral, that we can be passive or we can take this problem solving approach and we can be active in, in, in making change in being in, in creating action. And that's not just us, that's what happens in the classroom through the materials that we, that we create and use. Um, so we have to make more diverse situations, people, events visible. If we don't, then nothing changes. Um, you don't have the emancipation, you don't have equity, you don't have participation, and you don't construct a new narrative. So, so Francesca and I, um, she had written, um, she had done a study um, into a migration of Eastern European um, Eastern European migrants to Scotland and she had done some amazing um, work of how she documented it and in, in, in especially in, including telling the the participants telling their own stories and using photo um, photo journals and she and I talked a lot about what we could use this for in terms of bringing this out to a wider audience and so this is how we created the materials that I'm going to show you very quickly some of now. What we decided though, was that we weren't, although this, this, this um, focuses on lives of um, LGBT uh, migrants, the, the wider agenda of equality is very strong in the materials. So for example, we look at family life, um, we use the photo diaries to look at where, what people consider home and there's language work in there. These are very snippets here. And then we have stories that are written by um, different participants from the study. And we've pulled those together and then created some language learning materials. This one, Daniel, is about the story of someone transitioning. Uh, we have language learning tasks, but they are open. So we have a speaking and discussion task here where people are talking about attitudes and feelings and there is a discursive space opening up. You can go and access the materials and see more about what we offer or what we, we try to do with the materials. Um, but they have been used in Scotland um, by quite a few practitioners now, and we hope that more people will use them. They're a resource, they're not a course book. We don't expect people to use them in any specific way. We like people to create from them. So the next thing I want to say is that in a way we are very lucky because we, we live in a, a society where we are, we have a lot of openness and the availability or we are able to talk about most of the things we want to, in the classroom, out the classroom, wherever. However, often people are working in English language teaching and they're, they're in restrictive contexts. LGBT might not be something you can talk about. In my own situation in China, if I try to use any or put any of my LGBT materials into the resources that I create for the teachers who teach out there, they would be blocked immediately. So um, an example of another blocking that I had was um, we had written some material on advertising ethics and these two images came up where people, they weren't liked because they were too sexy. And we did change the Malbra ad one um, to something less, but I thought to keep the Dove ad, ad, as I explained, this was about racism and we wanted to look at ethics and so this was important. So I was allowed to keep that picture on one of my slides. It wasn't me teaching it, but it came against 
this scrutiny that you will have in restrictive contexts. So then what do you do? There are things you can do where you can still talk about things which are opening up people's minds. And this is a fantastic resource um, that focuses on the sustainable development goals. So I, again, I've given you links to this. Please have a look at it. I've used two of these resources um, and adapted them for materials that I've been using. Um, they focus a lot on 21st century skills, um, but also they look at the sustainable development goals and it helps you bring in diverse people and settings, I think. I've used two, one on tourism and one on education. I'm just going to show you quickly some of the stuff on education. This is interesting though. This is, comes from the front, the front of the, the booklet where it's one of the writers discussing what teaching is about. And this is nice. I teach them English, but discrimination, degradation, subjugating, how inequality brings poverty, how intolerance brings violence. How can you bring that into materials? So one of the things that I've done in the education one is I start with a discussion from this quote that's in a video called School is a Magical Place. And we have a discussion of that. And then we look at the differences between the UK and China in terms of education. And then we start to look at videos where the students get to see people in very, very different contexts. And there's three videos here. We don't have time to see them. Of course, you can go and look at them in your own time. Um, the lovely thing about this video, these videos is the school is a magical place comes out in this third picture at the top that you can see. These are clips from the videos um, where this young woman is talking about her lack of access to school. And so it's a magical place if you have school. Um, so this is very thought provoking and very useful to bring students into a way of being able to discuss things that perhaps may be in a way quite radical or make them think about things and talk about things. And another piece of material that I've worked on recently, again, I've introduced in, in, a, in China uh, that our teachers have used is looking at Glasgow and the slave trade. Um, and this has been actually has been very interesting for the students in particular because they're also, you know, as well as being students at the Chinese university, they're also part of Glasgow University. So it links to them understanding things about Scotland, rather than just learning about bagpipes and haggis, they actually learn something that might be quite important. Um, so here's a they watch a video after they're given some vocabulary, they fill in a, just a basic gap fill, but it's very, very important, very powerful. Um, and then they hear a video between uh, Graham Campbell, who's the first Afro-Caribbean counsellor in, in, in Scotland, in Glasgow, I think in Scotland, and um, Frankie Boyle, the comedian. And this is a discussion about the slave trade, fascinating stuff. Again, very nice thing to listen to. And then we tie it into Glasgow and Glasgow University and how Glasgow was involved in the slave trade too, and about the reparation that Glasgow has recently done um, to make up for the, the history of what had happened. Okay, so some more um, principles, which I will leave you with to think about. I'm sure you're going to get these slides shared. So I think you can look at them on your own. But bringing in authentic material, discussion, wide, wider themes at the same time as you're lang using language learning and using language, language materials as a resource, not a script, I think is really important. So I would say be bold, read your room, work out what the students want and need, read the world, what's around you. Um, use templates to construct once you've done all the messy bit and get other people to look at things, to see what errors or what difficulties there might be in the materials. Don't expect other teachers or people who are using your materials to understand what you want them to do with them unless you tell them. Nobody knows what's in your head. And one thing I would say is we should write 
what we know, yes, write about what you know, but I think you also need to start writing about what you don't know, but you need to get advice from people who do know more than you. So if you're going to write about LGBT issues, you need, I was able to write about those because I didn't write them. Those were, those were people's stories and I didn't have to, I wasn't creating a false story. Two books that I'm going to um, promote very quickly. This is by Tyson Seaborn. It's just out, hot off the press. It's somewhere on my desk, somewhere, very messy. Um, how to write inclusive materials. I haven't read any of it yet, I'm afraid. I got it on Saturday. I was full of I was going to read it, but I didn't. I went to the garden instead. And a chapter in this book, which uh, Francesca and I have written a chapter in this book about the creation of our LGBT inclusive materials and some references for you. And I don't know if there's any time left, but I hope there is for some questions. Let's see. <laughs> How much time have we got? Four minutes. Are we allowed five? Absolutely, go for it. Okay, I don't know if you want to tell me questions that are there and... Uh, yes, there are quite a few questions. If I can start with the most important ones, um, it, Jacqueline and some other people would like to know whether the slides will be made available. Yeah, except I, I have to say I'm going to take out the student videos because I don't have copyright to... Those come from... They came from SQA. I just had to use a rough cut and, and we don't have permission for those to enter.